experiment, Harlem River Drive. I'll let him tell you about it in a minute. In a minute. Hello, Jules. Kevin Bujo Jones. So it looks like we're going to be doing our Scully tour this summer. I have the last weekend, or second to the last weekend in August. Diane Bond, Orlando in the house, coast to coast, we got it going on, coast to coast, Berkeley to Orlando, and lots of places in between, mostly east and west coast though, and then we have our Midwest, we got the, got the mit, the mitten, I'm reading some things about Grand Rapids I'm not so excited about, but, <sighs> sip, sip, sip. Sip on your water, sip on your wine. So how was your Sunday while you sipped? I had a beautiful day. I, we did our 11-11 this morning and then hung out here a bit. Did some chores, as they say. And then walked with Lillian over to my mom's place. And we sat outside and we watched a robin build a nest. It was beautiful. She was good, too. She was like, put a little over here and then flying over. And it has streamers. I should take a photo of it. It's, it's not like a super tight nest. It's, it's got like some stuff, you know, so when it, the wind goes, it's going to blow a little. It's cool. <laughs> Hi, Jules. Fresno, Fresno up to Oregon, and Michigan, Benton Harbor, Grand Rapids, um, Coloma, Louisville. I forgot Louisville. And there's a Baroda. Hello, Mr. Ison. You are in Baroda, right? Mm. Mm, mm, mm. I'm drinking hot water. I'm loving it. Did you see my my light show? <laughs> it's really cool. I I found it last night. You guys know about my the box, the Pa Ben pandemic box. But I also found this little groovy light show and I put it I had it on last night and maybe you noticed a little bit. But then I started turning all the lights out. I just sat right down in my living room. Hi, Mary Carson. I sat down in my living room. It was after I, I um, filmed the, um, the sip song because that needed to be done last week, but I did it last night, this morning. And then I, um, I just sat there in the dark and did this whole thing. And maybe we should listen to a little bit more of that again. I liked it a lot. I don't know if y'all got my little radio. That's like from the beginning. Dylan. Dylan. I love it. So my guest tonight is from Berkeley, California, but I didn't meet him until he was already living in New York, but I knew all his friends and knew of him, and then I think we met, I think we met while they were on tour, Bobby Strickland, hi! rock star would you consider it well you're here so check this out tonight because then maybe you could come on the show sometime wow where are you are you are you all good sunshine summer sunshine tomorrow night tomorrow night but tonight it's somebody else my friend Steven Bernstein our friend Steven Bernstein you're laughing oh I'm so happy to see you so tomorrow night, Dr. Katie Summers will be on to discuss all things animal 
all things animal related to COVID. Michelle, hi. Um, she was going to be on tonight. But I had already booked Stephen and she and I were, Katie and I were texting and I missed it. So she's tomorrow night. My friend Elodie's tomorrow morning. But tonight, so Stephen Bernstein. That's him. We'll talk about this track. I need to know more about it. So he's played with, oh good, he's played with everybody. Jeff Metzger. Thank you. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? Voice lesson this week? Might help out with the refi energy. I am in Michigan, close to where you were when you were on tour with Todd Rundgren. Thank you for that. Where are you? I don't remember where you live. What? Bobby, do you know Stephen Bernstein? If you don't. Yeah, so we watched The Robin, Builder Nest, Gracie made some sauce. Hi, Vin Vinny. She made some sugu because it's Sunday. And we just hung out. Okay. All right, I will. And then I, Lillian and I walked home and we watched the most beautiful sunset tonight. Wow, did anyone see that? I did. Let's do this, shall we? Yo. Hey, what's up? All right. There's two things happening at once. You got two things happening? What you got going on? Hi. You're talking, and then you're talking at a different time here. Right. So... Can you lower the volume on what you have going on at home? Oh, hell yeah. There you go. Done. All right. Now let's do a little light tweaking thing. That light above your head. Okay. I know what you want. This. There you go. Ooh, there you go. That's it's super dark. That's kind of <laughs> dark. You want to be dark? Oh, that's all right. Kind of mysterious, cool. Ladies and gentlemen. Steven Bernstein in the in the square. I don't even haven't figured that one out yet. It's not in the house because we're all in our houses. Steven Bernstein yeah. in his house in Nyack. Yep. Oh, should I put on my glasses too? No, 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 no. You look not not with it. Not with a put them like that, baby. I even turned down the lights tonight because I had I have this lighting, this whole light thing going on in the background. And uh -huh. and that's the Bay Bridge back there. Okay. So what's going on? It's super chilled out here. We're just, uh, you know, I kind of don't mind it so far. I mean, I I'm I'm <laughs> not in a, <laughs> I, I'm definitely not in denial about what's going on. But it's also like, what the fuck? Well, it's going on. You might as well like be here and just enjoy it. Like I'm actually totally grooving on just. Letting a day go by and eating some food, doing this and doing that and having tea late at night and watching Larry David and the Three Stooges, you know, practicing. I like it. Do you, are, you a, are you a night owl? I guess so. I go to bed about 2.30. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Did anything change? No. Yeah. Well, yeah, I used to work for a living. Right, 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 right. So you'd be driving home from the gig around 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. Or even, even if I wasn't just at home I still like sometimes I was working it wasn't like I was at home for six 
and it's not like I've never been home for this long. Isn't that the crazy part? But when it get when it gets to ten months, that's going to be a little weird. Yeah. But we'll see when we get there. Yeah. You know. um, So. What kind of food are you eating? What's what what what's on the menu? Well, let me tell you something. There's a place called Wegmans. I just found out about, and it's like this, some sort of like New Jersey chain. It's almost like a Jersey fairway. Okay. And um, it's kind of hip, man. So I've been kind of grooving on going there. Like they, they got a wonderful chicken. If you like roasting a chicken, they got a wonderful chicken. They, they uh, I'm, I'm losing you there. Oh, mm-hmm. anyway, yeah. So I've been. But I, I, I always cook a lot. Like, cooking is my thing. So I'm just cooking all the time. You know, try to eat some greens every day. I walk the dog. I'm really into walking the dog. I <laughs> live for a long time every day. Have you seen those memes where they'll, they'll, the dog yeah. will be like, oh, what's no, this no. COVID shit all about? Yeah. No, no, both the dogs are like, well, my wife and my daughter walk one dog and I walk the other dog. So we got it worked out. I, I walk the really big dog. And that's kind of cool, you know. It's nice to walk a dog and, like, that's, like, you know, just let it. And I talk while I walk the dog. So I've had, like, amazing conversations. And, uh, yes, like, like, like every conversation is a half an hour, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so it's kind of crazy because I'm having, you know, four, four conversations is over two hours on the phone. Right. Now, when, when was the last time you spent two hours on the phone? I mean, you know, so it's kind of wild. Probably, probably with Sybilis, Sybilis Savage about half an hour ago. <laughs> Who is Sybilis say talking to the dog? See, that's so mean. No, I have these things, these these, these headphones, and you put them into your eye, eye telephone, and you just talk to people for uh-huh. like half an hour, you know. Okay, see, everyone's laughing about talking to a dog. Wait, did you hear about the guy um, whose job was, um, what was it? Oh, no, I forget. It was, oh, yeah. That his job. It was to crush, to crush cans, like, you know, cans and stuff. Did you hear about that? No, tell me. Wait, I'm trying to do something here. Okay. Okay. The guy, there was a guy, right? And his job was crushing, like, you know, like Coca-Cola cans and 7-Up cans, that kind of stuff. Okay. You know what he said about it? You know what? It, it was so depressing. Uh-oh. Hold on. I lost you. Technical difficulty. I'm just going to hold it because it's more fun. Okay. So what? So he's crushing cans? Yes, his job. His job was so depressing. Soda pressing. pressing. (laughs) Soda soda pressing. You like it? That's good. No, you don't really like that joke. I like it. It just took me a minute. My, My brain's a little thick tonight. Soda, soda pressing. Well, you know they're not taking back cans in Michigan. You get ten cents uh-huh. a, for each can. Uh-huh. Not happening right now. Yeah, I, we just recycle. I'm just a big recycle. I, I mean, recycling is like that's like one of the highlights of the week for me. Like when I pull the recycling out, and that was like when I moved to Nyack. Actually, it was funny. It's like I lived in New York for eighteen, no, twenty years, eighteen years, something like that. I get to this house. I'm like, oh, everyone said it's going to be cool. It's going to be weird. Going from the city to, like, living not in the city. And it didn't seem weird at all. But the first time I went to take out the the um, recycling, and, you know, because I'm a late late person, I took it out at, like, whatever, you know, one or two in the morning. And I suddenly freaked out because I'm on this, like, little street with no one on it. Right. And that seemed, that seemed dangerous to me. Like, if you walk out to 110th Street at 2 in the morning, there's people there. Exactly. I got really nervous. I, I feel now safer no- in New York pretty much than anywhere because there's always somebody around. Right. Yeah. yeah. Gary yeah. Lambert says hello. Where? I, it's, not, it's not on my computer yet. It's Gary Lambert's watching, and Sybilla Savage says you I, have her number. I know. She wants, she's going to get a phone call. Yeah. But I'm telling you, like, every phone call is so damn long, man. Some are an hour. They're crazy. <laughs> it kind of wipes you out, doesn't it? Well, it's just that everyone's got a lot to say, you know, and I don't blame them, you know, and most people are all right. I mean, you are know. you FaceTiming with people or talking? Oh, oh, oh. oh, hell no. I just talk. 
I'm super eight, like anti technology. Tech. I'm not even like really dealing with this whole like record yourself four times, those four little faces of you like wearing different outfits and all that shit. I yeah, mean, maybe I haven't figured I'll go, that one out yet. Yeah, maybe I'll go there, but I don't know. It just seems so. Really, is that what we? St- I'd rather like put stupid jokes on than like do that. But maybe, you know, maybe I will. Well, Ellen Hoffman just got the so depressing. That's a really good one. She said that my, you know, Ellen Hoffman. She's a piano player from the Bay Area. She said this dude is funny. Yeah, yeah. He's so really good. funny. Yeah. Um, so are you teaching? No. Okay. No, I'm just like living, and uh, it's kind of okay so far. I mean, it's gonna get weird, but right now, see, I recorded all this music, so I made like six. Record like six records worth of music between, which I usually don't do. I kind of stopped making records. Six. Yeah, I mean, I made, I made enough records. Who cares about making records at certain points? Like I used to get paid to make records. Right. So you know, I was like, why am I gonna like, but like, what am I gonna do? Like get famous or like, is that some, no sell a record? Um, but uh, yeah, and I got plenty. If you like my music, you can buy a record. But you know, who's gonna buy a record anyway. So. Why would I need to make another one? This, this is the one I already made. But I've been, I was, came into, I was, I got a grant to record a bunch of music. And Scotty Hall wanted to make a sex mob record. So I recorded, like, I guess five records with material, but um, like two records worth of original material. And then a record of like MTO, typical MTO stuff. Then Cat Russell with MTO. That's which is cool. kind of like. That's cool. Well, that's, well you know what that is? Is that song right on in Henry? It's a good song. It's a very interesting song for me to play in because it's a combination of those two kinds of music with someone I've known for a long time who really, you know, grew up with a lot of people in the band. So it keeps that community thing. I mean, she's known Eric since they were little kids. Matt monasteri has been in her, her band leader for, you know, so long. So, you know, she gets in there and it's pretty family, you know. And, um, like her mom and Ben's dad knew each other for a long time. Oh, cool. And, um, but anyway, and then the record of the Hot Nine stuff, but with Medeski on organ, and mm-hmm. like the unrecorded Hot Nine stuff. So it's all this music. So what I'm trying to do is spend my time trying to figure out how do you get music into the world now? With, and, and first of all, I want to ask you to do one thing. Can you please post a link? to the song that we played earlier that i played earlier the harlem experiment on this yeah okay you mean on the on the facebook on the feed yes please hi melanie and then steven or uh my friend is calling is in from india mto plays sly was genius according to our our resident uh writer gary lambert yeah, a link to that song. Melanie, you missed the song from the beginning. Check this tune out. It's bad. Tell us about, where did you record yeah, that one? Oh, that was so, so, so that was a record called The Harlem Experiment. So it was a period of time in the 90s, I guess, or the, no, the 2000s. I don't know when. Yeah, I guess the 2000s, but man, I was just making a lot of records because it was like, there was still a bit of a record industry and we were kind of, had a lot of friends who were producing records, so... This friend of mine, Aaron Levinson, made a record called The Philadelphia Experiment um, with um, Christian McBride, mm-hmm. Uri Kane, and Quest Love, and Pat Martino. So it was really successful. So then he made a record called, want to make a record called The Harlem Experiment. And they call his guys, and the guy calls me up. And he said, I got my whole plan, and, and you know, he told me about his whole, whole plan. And I said, well, that's really cool, but you know I'm not a problem. He's like, what? And I said, yeah. He goes, but man, I, you've always been on the Upper West Side as long as I've known you. I'm like, yeah, that's because you got here after I did, but I'm from Berkeley, California. Hmm. He said, well, fuck it, man. Um, like, I want you to be on this record, so we're just going to do it anyway. I said, okay, but everyone else on the record grew up in like Harlem or the Upper West Side or East Harlem or something like that. And um, so it was like Carlos Alomar. I mean, I actually think Ruben Rodriguez is from the Bronx or Brooklyn, but, he, you know, whatever. Don Byron's from the Bronx. I guess the Bronx, you know, no Harlem, Uptown. Berrios is probably the Bronx. But, uh, man, that, that feel, those 
those guys get, man. When you get grooving mm. and Carlos, I mean, it's just one of the coolest groups I play with. And we tried it in all these different ways. And I finally tell the producer, I said, why don't we try it? Because like, it was already done, but I played it a bunch of different ways. You know what I'm saying? There was a rhythm track. So I was trying different horns, different mutes. And I said, man, let me try it really dusted. Like thinking about how to drive, like being up a plane. I played, used to play gigs in the Bronx. Like you play like up in Sunday afternoon, some burnt out area of the Bronx. I said, well, man, let me try to like find a zone like Sunday afternoon in mm. the Bronx, the summertime in the early eighties. And, uh, I just found this crazy zone. It's kind of dusted and whack, but it was so cool. And he said, yeah, that's it, man. Like that, that's the feeling. I, you know what I'm saying? Because I had this cool canvas, but what, what feeling am I going to put on top of it? Anyway, I, I was, it was like, and no one ever heard the rap, but I always thought it was like a, just a great track. It's beautiful. I played, I must have played it 10 times tonight, and then I played it two, two times here already. Um, yeah, and Steve Barry. I mean, that's that real Mongo Santa Maria, that real Harlem shit, you know? Yeah. Um, so you were talking about records and why to make them now, and, you know, I mean, we're, we've, we've, kind of, we've gotten past that for sure. But, um, how, like, are you wanting to, to put music out online and do the whole Spotify? Yeah, and... yeah. I... Well, I've never... I've never been a big Spotify person. I yeah. kind of hate Spotify. I do too. You know, I, I always say like Spotify is like a bit like putting your music on Spotify is like inviting the person over to dinner who like raped and murdered your grandmother. Um, okay. And you know, some people, okay. Yeah, but you know, that's the way it is. And it is the way. But it, they are people who like are ability to make a living, you know. And, um, I'm going to do something. I lost you. But anyway, I'm just trying to figure out how to, what the best way to put it out. Like, you look for labels that even appoint that anymore. Just put it out yourself. You just print vinyl. Blah, 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 blah. Because there's so many possibilities. Have you put Have you put anything out yourself? Oh yeah. I thought so. So yeah. why not keep doing that? I don't know, because I think, like, I'm at that age where I just, it would be nice to have someone say, I don't know, it would, uh, some part of me just still feels like it would be nice to be treated with a little respect. You right. know, like, that, you're like, okay, this music, I don't know, man. It's just like, I just feel like it's good to have someone help helping out your music a little bit, like some sort of outside force. I, I believe it. I mean, only because I've put out, you know, I've done both. And sometimes, and it, it, they both, the problem is, I guess, if you put it out yourself and you have a lot of money towards making it work, then that's okay. But it's just kind of hard. It's like you're constantly thinking like, oh, do I have enough money to pay like this kind of PR person right it just adds one more fucking layer of shit in your life basically yeah and i get i guess having a record label is also another another la layer of shit but um because when uh, you're on a label yeah um i've i've been on labels and and but sometimes i feel like like, I've had a booking agent a couple times. People always say to me, like, oh, do you have a booking agent? And I go, well, I've had a booking agent, and I, I have my brothers helped me out, and, you know, and Rolf and I do our booking now. But sometimes the booking agent would – I'll never forget. I had, got a booking agent, and he called me. He goes, hey, I got you a gig. I'm living in Oakland, right? He goes, I got you a gig. And I said, where? And he goes, Yoshi's. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I – I sell out Yoshi's every year anyway, and I just haven't called there this year. Right. So sometimes I think that having a booking agent or a label, unless they're going to work just as hard as you do and harder, but but I get it. I don't know. I'm, I, I still like to make records because I love being in the studio, and I hope one day you and I get to do that as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But just to do it, you know, just to, to make it at this no, point. Cause... I, I, enjoy, I 
I've just made so many records at this point, and um, just kind of. But I, but I just had this big burst of also a desire to document things. You know, I'm always writing things. I mean, that's the whole thing. I, I went in and did five records with MTO. I could have recorded you know, four records with the music. But I could I could have recorded another two super easily. There's that many arra- undone un- unrecorded arrangements, you know. And same with Sex Mom. But it's just at a certain point, it's like, yeah. I mean, I feel like unless it's something really different, you know, like, so I wrote all this new MTO music, which which I'm really into. I just think it came out. Well, that's the whole thing. I'm kind of super excited about this music I wrote. And I've never done it with MTO. So I'm super excited. Because it's kind of, to me, it's like, well, it's almost like if you mix Duke Ellington and Levon, and I mean, I was trying to think, well, what is this music? Because I'm trying to, I'm listening to it. I didn't know what it was. Of course, you're always self-conscious when you do new stuff, or I am. Most people are. And I guess, I guess it's like, maybe if it was Levon and Duke Ellington and the Art Ensemble and Sly, that's kind of what this is, if you put them together because it's certainly not one kind of music it's certainly not like oh it's jazz music or it's this or that but it's something you know and I really like it and I think it's pretty and some of it's very very beautiful you know how Levon would sing those, mm-hmm. those he would sing those like country ballads and I, I would just you know that stuff starts to get into you and you're like well, I want to make some music that kind of feels like that you know just really pure not a lot of like that ego stuff that people like to play just right. just pure music stuff so but I think right now in this period of time people might be ready to hear some music like that instrumentally I think people are going to be ready for a lot I have people that are coming on and they don't know who you are so would you like me to introduce you or can you tell tell people who you are please sir uh, I'm Stephen Bernstein and I'm a musician, a uh, band leader, and an, an arranger, a trumpet player, and a slide trumpet player, and um, that's who I am. I've been uh, living in New York for 40 years, you know, going on the road, making records, and doing all that stuff. I've known Jennifer, actually not that long, considering how long I've known some people. Right. <laughs> yeah, because I'm not that old. Well, that's why. I guess that's why. Oh. Gary Lambert says, a Ben Porowski's here. Hi, Ben. Oh, Ben. Hi, ben. <laughs> Gotta go to bed. He's younger than me. I met Ben when I was in my t- early 20s, and he was still in high school. Can you dig that? I can and we used, that. Yeah, ben, we used, ben used to have to sneak into the Ritz when we played there. So we played ben, 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 Big Thing, when he was like 17, like, yo, man, uh, wh- where's the party? Like calling you Friday night about 10.30. Yo, man. Where's the party? Hey, See, man, you, man, you're party, you 17. No, he was younger. He was like 16 when I first met him. And then and then he was like, where's the party? Yeah, and, and yeah, Gary Lambert, it's really unclear how long I've known Gary Lambert, but close to 45 years. Yeah, yeah, close to 45 years. It's very unclear because Gary was, Gary was older than us, so we were in high school, and right. Gary was kind of grown up which means he was 20 19 who knows you know how long do you think you've known Sybil is savage that's also really unknown but probably close to 50 years but not I mean because I actually don't remember her from elementary school but I could have known her but definitely like you know junior high school high school era you know but I I could have known her we we could have been elementary school together I don't I don't you know play at the park I don't know she lived in my neighborhood I don't remember from John Muir I don't know do you have a mask what a computer yeah no a mask do you wear a mask oh uh, uh, yeah I only want to go shopping and then I um, I started wearing a, a, a bandana when I walked the dog because I realized even though like in Nyack like I'm never anywhere ne- near anybody when I walk the dog you know what I'm saying like I'm on the other side of the street but I realized some people bum out, so I started wearing like a purple bandana for it because it was like you know Mardi Gras. I mean, um, Jazz Fest. Jazz Fest, yeah. But, but like my shop, I wear obviously a mask, and, and uh, I'm super into quarantining. Like I'm really into quarantining. I love. I like. I just. I just want to wash my hands. 
I just want to, like, everything, like, constantly. I mean, you know, like, I gotta, I gotta say, like, uh, I mean, you know, my daughter and wife, like, totally get on my case, because I actually went on the road on the 9th of, 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 of uh, March. March 9th, and I wasn't gonna go, I called the guy the night before, and I said, man, I, I don't, I don't think I can do this, it was Ray Anderson, the trombone player, he was totally cool. Mm-hmm. I've seen you play with him at the 55. Right, so we're about to go to Europe, and I've been telling him, man, I don't know if it's a good idea, but nobody was canceling. I kept calling, like, all the bookers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No one was canceling. I'm kind of freaking out. I'm calling all these other people. They say, oh, blah, blah, blah. Ben from our songs. You know, people kind of like, they were, everyone trying. I, I think everyone wanted their business to keep going. No one was being honest. And I was like, this does not sound like a good idea to me. And that night before, like, everyone, my sister, my wife, my dad, I was like, man, you shouldn't go. So I called Bray, and he was told to pull. And the next morning, I just decided, fuck it, man, I want to play this music. I went like a fool, and it was a Monday, and that Wednesday night was when, you won't believe this, but guess what? Donald Trump is fucking president of the United States. You know that guy, Donald Trump, fucking total dickwad I don't, from New York? I, I don't know that name. Yeah, well, believe it or not, this guy is now the president of the United States. It's like the craziest thing ever. Anyways, and I knew, because I was telling Ray, like, all oh, this fuck. Because like, I also say, like, a Jew that understands like a little bit about exponential math is like dangerous because you're naturally paranoid because you're Jewish about like diseases. And then you understand the whole idea of exponential, like two people get four people sick, four people get 16 people sick, 16 get 32, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like everybody's sick. And uh, I went anyway, but I went home Wednesday. I mean, I have Thursday morning, but, um, so Ever it's good then. that you went th- Thursday. So you you let you got home on you left on the twelfth. You came home on no, the twelfth. No, I left Thursday morning. I uh, I don't know eleventh or twelfth. Like I would ninth was a Monday. Tenth, yeah, the twelfth I got home. Because mm-hmm. I was flying through Seattle on the twelfth back from <clears throat> Mexico. I was Mexico Seattle Seattle to Chicago on the twelfth, and the thirteenth oh is the day that they um stopped everybody like um coming back and people were stuck in. Like my right. customs in Seattle, I went through customs in like four minutes. From Mexico, right. they did nothing. There was no, you know, temperature check or anything like that. And then um, the, that Friday was people sitting in customs for six hours. Yeah, same with me. Same with me. I got through. But it was it was it was scary because it's like man, I wish they would have given me a temperature check or asked, were you in Italy or something? And they were just like, welcome to the United States, sir. Yeah, yeah, nothing. It was a bummer. It was a bummer. It's like, wait a second, you just made this federal announcement right. and you're like, no one like doing anything? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But anyway, I'm totally into anything and I'm super, to be honest, like, Jen, I'm telling you, like, I'm really not the idea of um, having my trumpet mouthpiece exposed out in the world with like kind of this horrible, this piece of love. I'm like, you know, I got friends that died. It's not like something that's not going to happen. So I'd rather not get it, personally. It's, I mean, that's, that's kind of my trip right now is like, don't, like, just make sure that when we get through this, you're ready to start rocking. Yeah. So, like, pain, stay strong, keep my chops up, boom, boom, boom. Do you take vitamins? Do you do herbs? Yeah. Okay. I walk every day, you know. I'm probably going to, you know, my mind's been lost already, so it's not like it's going to be any more lost. It's like, so, you know, that part's taken care of. So there is one question here. Well, Gary, Gary brought up something about George Carlin growing up near Columbia. Oh, yeah, he grew up, um, I know exactly where he grew up, Morningside and like 119th or 121st, because there's a street, George Carlin Street up near 121st. But um, another friend of mine posted and wanted you to speak on, where did it go? Was it after Ben? Oh, Joseph Romer. Can you tell us about, I think you've met Joseph in LA, but um, can you tell them your experience playing with Little Feet and Levon? A little bit about that, do you mind? Well, um, well, first I'll tell you like, 
there's a cool thing about Levon is that he, like we, the first two years I played with Levon, it was like an improvisation gig. So mm. basically, Levon would just start a tune, me and Eric Lawrence would just, just play. And usually he would go, yeah, man, yeah. And every once in a while, he'd go, no, man, no. <laughs> and we just sucked. And it became this amazing gig where, you know, like, you know, band, we won three Grammys and we were playing like giant shows. And when Levon passed away, it was like they wrote about it in, you know, the CBS News and the this and that. And this start, it was just this like amazing homemade gig that we grew, we grew it like mold. That's what Jimmy Vivino said. We just grew it like mold. We just started playing. And you can see on YouTube the very first play with him this way Levon was he put it out on like a couple DVD I hadn't even met him because he didn't come to, he didn't like we were at his place but he didn't come down and meet us or rehearse or anything we played a set with him. and at one point Levon just walks out and he was like hey snap the drums and starts playing and singing mm-hmm. and that's how I got to meet him he just looked over me like hey man and like just that was it kind of said like can't call a tune off and play it you know and um it grew into this amazing gig, you know, for eight years. And it was the best, it was kind of the best gig ever because it had the framework of playing for a good leader. So, like, you feel like, oh, cool, because Levon's such a cool guy and such a. But in a sense, you could also kind of what you wanted as long as it's what Levon wanted. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. And as a certain a bit more of a show like he lost his voice we had to kind of build more of a show around it and so it was more like even if Levon couldn't sing that well it would sound good to people and you know be impressive and all that kind of stuff people like but it was such a soulful gig and, and he paid it he took such good care of his band even if we were doing a benefit he would always tell him like well you don't need to pay me but you gotta pay the band mm-hmm. like you know no one needs a benefit as much as musicians you know are for their money you know he was such a cool, he was just the coolest guy ever. And and Little Feet, I mean, that's more of a new experience for me. I mean, I've known him for about years, and I've been touring with him for three years. And um, their way, they're really improv. They're the opposite. They're kind of the opposite thing like Levon, you know, like Levon would like little songs, but it was kind of like almost anything could happen. And Little Feet, you know, they have these songs playing. Anything can happen, but they've also been playing these songs for 50 years, so they, they know where this, They really know the songs, you know? Right. And, and oftentimes, they, they get through the song the way it's... Usually what they do is they play the song a certain way for, like, two minutes, and then, like, something happens. And it's kind of like they really go... And they go... They just stretch so far out it's pretty damn cool because, you know, usually you're playing a gig like that. It's really not that way. And, um, you know, it's an amazing song. Levon, I knew about his music a little bit because I had a record by the band called um, Rock of Ages, and I love that record. But, you know, I didn't know much about Little Feet. You know, I don't, I'm kind of, you know, I, not there's not tons of, I mean, I know about rock music, but I'm not like a, guy that grew up listening to rock music so i my my appreciation of little appreciation of them has come later like realizing like what an amazing band little feet is but i didn't really know that they were but did you read what can you read what gary said that's one of my favorite things about levon fed is that, yes yeah well and, and the thing is see that's what that's what levon wanted i mean levon could have easily picked like rock and rollers who knew every rock and roll tune mm-hmm. and it would played it a certain way but he had these guys around him who like we didn't necessarily know every rock and roll tune but we knew music and New Orleans feeling and Levon was really into the whole like New Orleans of, of, of um, call and response you know and so we there, that's what I'm saying it was very improvised like you would just hear him play and sing and you would just respond to it and I mm-hmm. really like that so a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, want to just like, like have, have it be like a show. Like someone like Gary Rose Springsteen. Like Springsteen's a show. You know, you go to a 
Bruce Springsteen show is unbelievable, but that's a show, man. That's been rehearsed, you know. And then it just and and it and, and it's all good, and it just keeps going. Have you ever played with him? No, no, no. I don't. I don't really know him. I mean, I I guess I met him once or twice, but you know, I got called to play with him. I always say it was my year of success. I had to turn down Springsteen and Jay Z in one year. <laughs> Say, sorry, and, man, I can't do the gig. Thanks, Jay. Do you call him Jay Z or I, Jay? I don't know how famous Jay Z was, but I was working all, all the time. Even at Joe at Carnegie Hall, like the comeback show. And I guess like my kids, like maybe my daughter was, or my, either my daughter, or my son was graduating from L school. And I just remember they were like, they were like, what? You didn't play with Jay Z for our stupid elementary school graduation? Oh, and I, good for you. Like, yeah, I didn't. Well, I missed it. I missed a lot of stuff, but I was just like at the time there was so much work, and I didn't really know how famous Jay Z was or how good he was. I was like, ah, eh, some like guy wants doing a show at Carnegie Hall, for whatever. I remember. I probably, you. Go ahead. you know, I think the thing was that like the rehearsal was during the graduation, and the gig wasn't. I could have worked with Levon anyway. I was like, I could go to the graduation and work with Levon. Why not work like Jay Z? But and then Springsteen, I had my own tour. They called me about doing that, um, uh, um, you know, uh, um, the guy wrote all the songs, Woody Guthrie tour. Mm. Hmm. I don't and, know. and, and there were, and, um, anyway, they said the guys who made the record could do it because they were, the, they were the guys from, uh, the Conan band that made the record and they had used to tour with Spruce. So they, the guy called me and said, can you? Oh, Which Max one? Weinberg, and yeah, 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 okay. But not mm -hmm. them, but the horn players from that. Okay, okay. Those horn players have made the record. And Trump, the punk, Mark called me up and goes, man, I think you, you could do this gig, it would be cool. And I said, what are the dates? And they looked at the dates, and I said, man, I got my own tour, you know, in Europe with my own music, and you can't, like, you can't cancel your own tours, you know. The Seeger Sessions, according to Gary. I, I think they played Seager in Seager. Berkeley, yeah. Oh, I, I, I vaguely remember that now, okay. Didn't, so one night, Sybilla, you and Sybilla and I, you dropped us off on the Upper West Side, and I can't remember what gig you had done, but you had just done some a recording with Elvis Costello that day. That that record won a Grammy. Did it? Yeah, and I didn't even know that. And I was like, and then I found out, and I emailed him. I was like, Elvis won a Grammy. He goes, Yeah, for adult contempt, like contempt, no contemporary. Wait, adult contemporary rock or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, because he matured once he he married Diana, then it was not it, he, it kind of changed his whole thing. Yeah, I remember you were like, yeah, I, I did this session with Elvis Costello today, and I'm like, because oh, I'm a huge Elvis fan, and I sing his music, and there you were. Yeah, I hung out. I, and you weren't bragging about it. You just said, yeah, I did this gig with Elvis, a session with Elvis Costello today. And, okay, good night, Stephen. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Well I'm just lucky in that, like, I know through Hal and through Levon, I met all these guys, and I like rock music, so... Oh, no, I my like, friends are rock stars. You're a rock star. I mean, whatever, you know. And it, I gotta say, Elvis is totally cool, and his dad was a trumpet player. I don't know if you know that. His father was an amateur. Um, Did not know that. Yeah, like, you know, like they call it trap music, like like British people play Dixieland style. Okay. So like one time I was I, I saw him at a gig and he he looked look man I got all these pictures of my dad with his horns and he brought all these pictures of his dad you know dressed in like a little suit on his little gigs like there's a whole tradition in Europe of people that that like imitate early Louis Armstrong records uh -huh. they call it and it's an interesting story what do they call it tell me again trad t r a d trad jazz okay yeah and but they don't say trad jazz they say trad trad they, okay trad and there's a whole thing with this guy, Chris Barber, and Alker Bilk. And, I mean, Alker Bilk was, like, more commercial, but, like, Chris Barber and, the, and another dude. And, and one of them had a hit. There's a whole thing with them and Skiffle Music, you know about this, and Rock Rock County Line and Lonnie Dunn. A little bit. I, I, I know what you're talking, and I, my brain, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. There's this trad music that they did in after the war, and 
they would also play skiffle when they put their, their like trombones and their trumpets and they pick up kazoos and washboard basses mm-hmm. and they would do some skiffle song. This is this story that Billy Bragg told me. So I don't know if this is true. So yeah, Billy were, Bragg told him this story one night. <laughs> well, they did. I believe it. Okay. Um, so um, he said the movie Rock Rock Around the Clock, whatever it was called, had come out in England. It was a huge hit. And, and some guy, one of the English companies said, didn't we record one of those track bands doing a skiffle song called Rock, I think it's called Rock County Line. It was a Lead Belly song. And this guy Lonnie Donegan with all the trad guys is playing this song. And it became a huge hit in England. And that started the skiffle craze. And the skiffle craze is is what the Beatles and the Stones and the Who and the Kinks and Mott the Hoople and all that music came out of this music that came from Louis Armstrong's music. Isn't that interesting? Interesting. Like, I would have never thought that the kinks came from Louis Armstrong. Not at all. I don't, I don't get that. But... but Like the who. Like the who came from Louis Armstrong. Like, that's the craziest thing. So, yeah. I'm not Skip. really a who fan. It took me a while. Let me tell you something, Jenna. People be like, check out the who. I'll be like, what is it? It doesn't even sound like music. Yeah. I mean, it's cool, I guess. But I started to hear it. It takes a while to hear it. It's so it's a different way, you know, but it's, I, I finally heard it. Yeah, at first I, I just saw it. says a bunch of noise. Do you but, know, you know this, this term, Rock Island Line? Rock, what's that? Rock Island Line. Rock Island Line. I love it again. That started the skiffle phrase. Phrase. Yeah, Rock Island Line. Yeah, Thanks, Rock Island so that was uh, this is what Billy Bragg said. That's that you can you can trace even all that English that kind of music, you know, that the kinks and all that stuff to Louis Armstrong. Yeah, I believe it. That's crazy. Yep. What's happening? You got, going you, you got all dark. What happened? The computer went dark. Yeah, in fact, there it goes. Gentlemen, me alive. We're here. Steven Bernstein in the house, in the square, in the box, in the... Yeah, it's crazy. I am I like, you know, I, I, I quarantine when I come off tour anyway. So this is just like being off tour for a long time. Steven Bernstein's watching. Hey, I'm going to wave. Rock on the line. Rock on the line. What year did you move from Berkeley to New York? Uh, August 79. Yeah. Wow. I'll tell you, a lot of change birthday years. But, you know, that's the whole thing, is things change everywhere. I mean, nothing doesn't change. Yeah, Berkeley's you know? different, though. Definitely. But, it's definitely different. Where'd you go now? He left. What do you mean, Berkeley's different, though? Okay, no, I'm back. I see it's a time. It is me looking at that thing. That's what I see. Okay. It's so, yeah, so you're looking look. into my... Oh, wow, Melanie. So, um, great vocalist, musician extraordinaire from the Bay Area, also from New York and New Mexico. The Cultural Heritage with uh, Linda Tillery. They did uh, recorded Rock Island Line. Right. That Melanie. makes sense. Oh, I... bye, Lion. So, say goodbye to India. Delhi. Wow. Yeah. People all over, man. It's fun. Um, Berkeley, well, it's just different. Every, You know, when I go back, there's a new building. There's a new cafe. There's a new box building with apartments that all look the same with, you know, drive through West Oakland. When was the last time you drove through West Oakland? No, it was, I just did. It's incredible. No, it's incredible. And I, and the other thing is that that whole area of Telegraph that they, Temescal neighborhood. Right. Telegraph and 50th. Yeah. Like, that's kind of crazy. They're starting to put new buildings up there, but there's, most of them are the same old, like, 40s apartment houses that used to be, like, super affordable. 
and there's all these fancy restaurants downstairs. Now. Super fancy restaurants. Well, the, remember yeah. the Pussycat Lounge, Pussycat, what was it, Pussycat Theater? on the corner now has this huge building because I lived about six blocks from there for the last few years and I watched that building. It's one of those it's segments and they it's, it looks like a bunch of trailers that they're connecting together. Right. And it's right on the corner of Telegraph and 51st, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50 first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's almost unrecognizable for sure. But great restaurants and cool walking around and, you know, you can get yeah it's just um because that used to be like really the, the like place where like if you didn't have any money that's where you could live <laughs> yeah and you and then you could go to Bertola's and get a bunch of food and drink a bunch of alcohol yeah for cheap so yeah i've I mean, like i said i know it's it, anytime if you're going to be alive this long you're going to see change i mean new york has totally changed in 40 years I mean, you know, so, but I just, you know, when a, a place as little as Berkeley changes, it's just, you know, it was, you know, just, it's just a little more, I don't know why, but yeah, things change, but, um, and do your parents live in the same place that the Raiders live? Yeah. Okay. My passed away in, in September. He did? Yeah, she did, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. That's okay. I mean, I'm sorry too, but you know, it was her time. I, I can say that. Okay, yeah, I hear you. My dad and Chris, yeah, I know. It's part I mean, of my, life. My mom was such a fucking rocking person, man. And, you know, her, you know, she was going through the dementia, and things were starting to change, and she kept it really together. Like, she was, like, the happiest dementia person ever. And it, that was starting to change. Uh-huh. Almost like her body was like, yeah, I don't want to be that person. She had a stroke, and just didn't last that long and she got out quick so it was you know I, I think it was kind of a graceful way to do it personally it's like you're here things starting to change you hold it together as long as you can and then she out. made the choice yeah I mean who knows she really made the choice but it, it happened you know and and uh but I have a, a great story like right near the end we were walking and she would be pretty out, but we were, I was always holding her hand and walk, and we're walking, and this kind of younger couple walking up, maybe my arm was in hers, and we were talking, and they were talking, and the guy stares at me, and they were talking really rapidly, and they walked past us, and the guy turns around and goes, wait a second, he goes, how long have you two been together? <laughs> <laughs> and they, forever, that's my mom, and the guy kind of looks embarrassed and keeps walking, and then and then, because my mom dyed her hair, and, you know, she was kind of slim. And then she's just cracking up and cracking up. And then finally, after all block, she looks at me. She goes, well, she goes, I feel great, but you must feel like shit. <laughs> like, she had only kept her humor, man. It, that was such a beautiful, abstract way thing to say, you know. So, yeah. But anyway, my dad still lives there. Yeah, they live on the same floor as the Raiders. Okay. So that's, what that- that's a cool place. I've been to lunch there with the Raiders and... Hung out with them. My my parents had a similar story. My my brother Nino and my mom used to go have get hamburgers at this particular place at Z, at a um, Vicky Sandbar in St. Joseph, Michigan, and she, and he, and my mom. It was my mom and my brother for years, right. and then after my brother died, my dad started going with my mom. And the same server would wait on my mom, you know, was there forever. And she was waiting on my mom and she was acting really weird. Right. And and my mom's like, gosh, she usually is really friendly with me and, you know, and and knows what my mom likes to drink, her little Baileys with coffee. And, and the woman was like, and my dad went to the bathroom and and the, and my mom goes, do you remember me? She said, yeah, but I'm a little uncomfortable because I'm so used to seeing you with your husband. And and who is this? She's like, this is my husband. He's like, well, who was that before? Because that was my my son. So, yeah. That is classic. Yeah. That's a classic. Good. It's good. It's good. Oh, I'm getting a low battery sign here. Oops. Okay. Wrong one. So, we could do this all night long. You know that, right? We could just yeah. keep talking and talking. And, and we don't have to hang up yet, but... Yeah, Bertola's fifty cent drinks, one double dollar doubles and fifty triples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I dated a bartender at 
at Bertola's in the eighties, so I, I don't, wow. I never paid for a drink, but I know that they were cheap, and they were big. I would love to invite you to come back sometime. Come back where? Here. I will. On eleven eleven with Jenna. Okay. Well, listen. I love you. I'll be watching you, and um, maybe I, I probably won't see you eleven eleven in the morning. But eleven eleven p.m. is my time. All right, babe. All right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Bye. I'm gonna play that same song again. Do it, man. It's okay. a winner. It, it really is. Thank you. Good night. Ooh, sorry, I have to hide his his identity. His identity. See, I've been watching Shit's Creek a little too long. Thank you, Stephen. Everybody, right? Stephen, Stephen Bernstein. Ooh. Yeah, see, we can tell stories and stories and stories and stories. But, oh, Soul Brothers Kitchen, I loved it. Melanie, I don't think you checked this. You were able to hear this song earlier. I'm going to start it over again. The Harlem Experiment. Harlem River Drive. Steven, if you're still there, can you post this link? And if you don't, I will. So tomorrow... Getting dark in. Tomorrow, Elodie is on at 11, 11 in the morning. And then Katie is on tomorrow night. You guys, thank you so much. I'm going to go dance, walk my dog, Ellen Hoffman, Wednesday night, I think. Good night. Love hard. See ya.